verse 26, and then go through to chapter 2, verse 8. So it's Genesis 1, starting at verse 26, through to chapter 2, verse 8. God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them. God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given to you, to you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth. And every tree was seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them, and on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the earth. There was no man to work the ground. And a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And we end our reading there. We trust the Lord will bless the reading of God's precious, holy, and infallible word to our hearts. Congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ. This morning our text is the first three verses of chapter 2. We return to another important aspect of our relationship with the Lord because that has been our focus as we have come here to the book of Genesis. The important relationship, the covenant relationship that we have with our covenant God. An important aspect of that covenant relationship is Sabbath rest. Our Sabbath rest. The Lord created this rest on the seventh day of creation. Our text says this. It says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. Verse 2. And on the seventh day God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done. And it's threefold repetition there. This is the work that he has done. Now he says, in creation. In creation. God gave us this day. A day of Sabbath rest. For our blessing. For our good. He made it holy. Remember, Jesus himself said, the Sabbath was made for man. And not man for the Sabbath. So the Sabbath day is an important day. A part of the seven days of creation. That God has given to mankind. We are to observe this day. Remember the Sabbath day. And my hope is that this will be a day of delight. 
that you will delight in, that I will delight in, a day to be thankful for. Not because it's a day off and that we can sleep more or even spend more time with family, but rather because as those who belong to Jesus Christ, remember, we're not our own. But we belong to God. We claim him. We claim Jesus as our own. And our hearts desire to keep his commandments. And a part of his commandment to us is to remember the Sabbath day. And to keep it holy. To enjoy this day. So that it is a delight. Delight to our souls. We consider the Lord's day. Not just a duty. I'm not here just out of duty. Just because it's a requirement. We recognize the fourth commandment makes it a duty. We just read the law. But to focus on the pleasure and the enjoyment that the Sabbath is designed to produce even within you and me. Your covenant God wants to meet with you. He wants to spend time with you. He wants you to worship him. In fact, the Heidelberg Catechism says this, with joy, with joy, I regularly attend the assembly of God's people. With pleasure, I want to learn what God's word teaches. With sincerity and truth, I desire to participate in the sacraments. With anticipation and a true heart of faith, I need to pray to God. That's what this place is, a house of prayer. So to pray to God, not just have the minister pray, but we all enter into that praying. And with generosity, my desire is to bring Christian offerings for the poor. When we take this type of attitude, our observance of the Lord's Sabbath is a positive experience to us. A time whereby our spirit is renewed and strengthened. Our faith is encouraged. We can draw near and close to our covenant God and know his presence with us. May it never be a negative experience to come to church. And remember, congregation, we're not just coming to church. I hope that's never your attitude. Rather, I'm here to meet with God. I want to meet with God. I want to fellowship with God. I want to know God. My desire is that he reveal himself to us in his holy word and that I can respond to this word in faith and trust. But it begins with Sabbath rest. Sabbath rest. A day for our souls. And what does he tell us here about this Sabbath rest? Here in Genesis chapter 2. First it says that God finished his work. That's what he's done. In fact, he said it three times. He finished the work that he had done. This was a work of creation. A work that only he could possibly do. Remember, you and I create nothing. We only recreate from that which God had originally put into place. Ex nihilo. Making all things of nothing. In the space of six days. And he declared it even as we've just read at the end of chapter 1. It's all what? Very good. At this point he declares it all very good. And then as we come into chapter 2. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished. And the host of them. And then God says no. I don't want you just to have six days. It's not just six days. You're to have a seventh day. A seventh day. And on the seventh day, finished his work that he had done. And he rested then on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. God finished or completed his work. God's work in the heavens, right? The farthest reaches of the universe. Complete, finished, very good. Even as Solomon said, I perceive that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God has done it so that the people fear before him. God has done it. God has done this. And he pronounced it good. 
He could have just easily finished it in a moment. In a moment, he could have spoken and everything exists. Right? Remember Jesus, when he fed the 5,000, it's not that he had to have a, a length of time in order to produce a whole lot of extra bread and fish to feed all those people. He merely blessed God, blessed the food, and they distributed it, and it was done instantly as they distributed that food to all those people. That's the power of God. But he took six days, six days, and each day specifically creating each part of the world and creation. And that is done for our sake, for our instruction. We follow that same model, do we not? We labor for six days as God labored for six days, and we spend our one day of rest recognizing what God has done. And so this is for our instruction. What does it mean when it says that God rested from his work? What does this mean? Does it mean that God was exhausted? Worn out? Tired? He had done all this creative work. He expended all this extra energy. He had to rest on that day. It was a big week. Worked more than 40 hours. Needed to rest? I mean, that's how we feel, don't we, after a week? <laughs> I feel pretty exhausted sometimes. I'm sure you do too. As you labor and you do your work and you think, oh, thank you for that day of rest. Ah, oh, I can just take it easy today. I don't have to do anything. No calling the office. No going to that, that workshop of mine, doing this work and all these, all these projects. Ah, oh, I'm so thankful. Whew. Take a day off. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the day off. I mean, is that the attitude that we should have? Certainly, for us, there is an aspect here of resting in the true sense where we need a day right, to recharge because there's a whole lot happening in our lives and we can be certainly overwhelmed and feel overwhelmed. And the Lord gives us that day where we can separate ourselves from the cares and concerns of this life and just have a day whereby we can focus on that which is good, that which is from God, Christ our Savior. There's an aspect of that. But we should not think of God resting on the seventh day because he was given to sheer fatigue or exhaustion. That he was just worn out and he just needed his day. That's not what's happening here. The word translated rested is the Hebrew word Shabbat, where we get the word Sabbath from. It is the name of the day that the Lord said that you are to cease from normal activity. And that's what the word means, to cease from labor, to cease from work. God's rest was the rest of completion he ceased from creative activity. He said he completed or finished the work that he had done. He emphasized it by saying it three times. The work of creation is done. Remember, God is one who never gets weary. The Bible tells us. And Adam must have rested as well, fellowship with the Lord and worshipped him. So to say that God rested is an anthropomorphism, a description of God's activity in terms of that which is conductive to man's understanding. It's for us to understand and know as God ceased from his labor, completed his labor, so also we cease from our labors, from our worldly activities, and spend this day focused on him. That's what he desires. That's what he wants. For Isaiah 40 says, Have you not known, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. So he's not worn out or tired. But he rested in order to give us an example that we should and must follow. That is to labor for six days and then cease on the seventh day from all our labor and activity.
However, we do not rest on the seventh day, do we? Which day do we rest on? The first day of the week. The first day of the week. Because we recognize another one who also finished his labor, do we not? Because it's not going to be long when we are going to read here and talk about the fall of mankind, the sin of mankind, the separation between man and his God, and the need for restoration. And there's another one that comes and he also finishes his work, does he not? He completed that work that was done. When he was on Calvary's cross, he was able to say, it is finished. So that his people may rest in a finished work for salvation. We call it the Lord's Day. It's the Lord's Day. Commemorates not the crowning work of creation, but the crowning work of redemption and testifies to the new covenant relationship that we have because Jesus fulfills everything for us. Fulfills righteousness for us. Fulfills holiness for us. Gives us knowledge and understanding. Restores us to that place whereby we can truly say, yes, I am in the image of God because Jesus is making me in the image of God. Because without Jesus, I'm under his wrath and curse. Without Jesus, I'm corrupt and guilty and I'll only face his judgment. But praise be to God, we have one who fulfills righteousness for us and he finished the work. By grace we're saved through faith, that not of ourselves, the gift of God. Lest any man should boast. We have nothing to boast in but Jesus. And so the early church gave special honor to the first day of the week, recognizing Jesus' resurrection. He rose gloriously over the grave on the first day of the week. And ever since that day, we come together on the first day of the week and we recognize Jesus' finish or complete work for us. He overcame the grave. He overcame death. As the hymn writer said, Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. It's Jesus and only Jesus that washed it white as snow. Praise God for that. Praise God that he finished his work. Right? Finished the work of creation. We recognize that. Right? The Old Testament saints recognize that. We now recognize the finished work of Jesus. We recognize that. And we come together and we worship him on the first day of the week. Praise be to God. And so the Sabbath rest is a rest of completion. A rest of completion. But God blessed the Sabbath day. He blessed it. Verse 3 says, So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in his creation. Right? In creation. This day is different than the other six days of the week. It's not the same we recognize it's different. The original word barak or barash is generally translated to bless, has a very broad meaning. It's frequently used in scripture in the sense of speaking well of this day. He speaks well of it. So God has spoken well of the Sabbath and of those who certainly desire to observe it. He blessed it, He made it holy, it's set apart. It's set apart. He sanctified it. Denotes an extraordinary distinction placed upon the seventh day and shows that it was devoted to sacred purposes. Sacred purposes. That's what this day is meant for. It's not a common day. In fact, as we've read from the law, Exodus 20, verse 8, remember the Sabbath day. He says to us in the fourth commandment, observe the Sabbath day and to keep it holy. We see there the connection between Genesis chapter 2 and the law of God where he says, even at the point of creation, when I made man, I desired that he would spend this day not doing his own thing, not pursuing his own pursuits, not in his labors, not in his tasks, but I want him to stop and I want him to separate himself and come to me and spend time with me. 
Remember the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. It's not a common day. Not an ordinary day. It's a separate day. Six days, he says, you shall labor. He spells it out for us very clearly. We just read it as well. Six days you've all, you have to uh, do your labor, your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to cease. Right? Sabbath to cease. To the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. In fact, your household will not be involved in work. You, your son, your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, even your animals are involved in this. They're to rest. Even the stranger, the sojourner is within your gates. Six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them. He rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. He's repeating again what he said here in Genesis chapter 2. And what does our catechism say? How is the Sabbath to be sanctified? Our shorter catechism, question answer six. The Sabbath is to be sanctified by a holy resting all that day, even from such worldly employments and recreations as are lawful on other days. So the things that we freely do on other days. Spending the whole time in public and private exercises of God's worship, except so much as to be taken up in the works of necessity and mercy. Necessity and mercy. We're not to take a legalistic approach to this day. Observing the Sabbath is not a list of, a list of do's and don'ts. If this is all it has become to you, you're missing out with God. Well, as long as I don't do this, this, and this, and I do this, this, and this, I'm good. But the Lord designed this day for your spiritual refreshment and for your good. I can keep a list of holiness perfectly. So could you, probably. But if my heart is cold and filled with worldliness and pride, I can certainly still break the Sabbath. Can't I? And I do not keep it as he intended it for me to keep. And I'm not refreshed. I'm not strengthened and courage in my faith. In fact, I can bring nothing but grief to myself and to my soul. May the Lord enable us then to have a good and proper attitude that when I come to this place, when I meet with God, I want this day to be a... a, a a day where God is uplifted and glorified in my heart and my soul. I want to meet with him. I want to fellowship with him. I want to enjoy him. I want to glorify him. I want to know his power and his presence. But the reality is there are works of necessity and mercy. Right? Jesus himself was charged more than any. For what? Breaking the Sabbath. Those religious leaders, they came to him time and time and time again. You know, six days you have for healing. The seventh is not a day for healing. Jesus said he's the Lord of the Sabbath. And we're to remember mercy. And so there are times when there are works of necessity and mercy. Right? To be merciful. That's why we want our doctors working on Sunday because what happens if one of you here even have a heart attack right now? And that could happen. You'd want to be able to have help. A work of mercy to help you in that time of need. Ambulance attendants and workers. Right? Police officers and so on. I mean, there are those who work on this day because it's a work of mercy, a work of necessity. And there are also times, I know some here, you have to work on Sunday. I have to provide for myself. I have to provide for my family. And the only job I can get involves working on a Sunday from time to time. And I pray to God to guide and direct me. In fact, I remember having conversations. So I pray for God to provide another job, but he hasn't done it yet. This is the job. And so remember, we, we're not to be legalistic about this day. We recognize there are times when it's what the Lord has provided for me, a work of necessity, a work of necessity. As, remember, and I know this is usually the text that we talk about, when Jesus with his disciples were walking through the, the cornfields 
and, uh, and the disciples were plucking the corn. You know, in, in the eyes of the Pharisees. Well, they're working. They're working on Sunday. How dare they do that? They're breaking the Sabbath. How can you allow them to do that? They have to eat. The Lord has provided food. A work of necessity. And there's times for works of necessity. And we recognize that. We recognize that. But when it's within our power, within our ability, we cease from our labors and our desires to meet together with God's people in the house of worship to set this day apart as the Lord enables us to do so. Because the Lord has blessed the Sabbath day. And his desire is to bless you through the Sabbath day. To bless you. This day, is not a des this day is not designed to be a burden to you. Not designed to make your life difficult or hard. Designed to bless you. That's what this day is designed to do. God blessed the seventh day. He made it holy for you. Because on it, God rested from all his work that he has done. His expectation is that you would also, within your ability, as God directs your life providentially, to also take, it, take this commandment to heart and to rest, to cease on his day. This is for you. This is for you. Even as the Heidelberg Catechism says, and I quote it already, but that, the God, that, that this, is, this is what God... This is what God's will for us is on the fourth commandment. Right? That the gospel ministry and education for it be maintained. That especially on the festive day of rest, I regularly attend the assembly of God's people to learn what God's word teaches, to participate in the sacraments, to pray to God publicly, and to bring Christian offerings for the poor. And second, and this is another aspect too, that every day of my life I rest from my evil ways. And we recognize that. We need rest from our own evil ways. Let the Lord work in me through his spirit. So I begin already in this life. The eternal Sabbath. The eternal Sabbath. Lord help me to rest. Rest in you. Rest in Christ. That you will continue to work in me through your spirit so that in this life I can already begin the eternal Sabbath, the eternal rest that I have in Jesus. And this leads to my last point here, to make the Sabbath your delight. We are to make it our delight. Now, when you talk about the Sabbath, I mean, I could, have, I could preach a series on this subject. There are ministers who, who preach multiple sermons on this subject. I'm just going to highlight just a couple things. Isaiah 58. Isaiah 58. And if you'd like, you can turn there. Look at it with me. Verses 13 and 14. Isaiah 58. If you turn your back, or I should say, if you turn back your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, and the holy day of the Lord honorable, if you honor it not going your own ways, or seeking your own pleasure, or talking idly, then you shall take delight in the Lord. And I will make you ride on the heights of the earth. I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. I mean, what a great blessing, isn't it? Lord wants me to delight in the Sabbath because when I'm delighting in the Sabbath, what am I doing? I'm delighting in Him. I'm delighting in the Lord my God. That's what I'm doing. This text shows that the Lord desires that we experience joy and blessing on the Sabbath to ride upon the high hills to be fed with His bountiful supply. There's a paradox here. We're not to seek or to do our own pleasure on this day, but we find pleasure in the day. Because we find pleasure in our God. It causes us to focus on Him. Because when we're living this life, every day there's all kinds of things that grab our attention, isn't there? There's all kinds of things that make us weary and worn. 
Sometimes I think, oh, I'm exhausted after the day. Done a lot. Whole lot of things out there to discourage us. Whole lot of things to steal away our faith. Make us think that we're alone. Where's God in this situation, that situation? All kinds of things that discourage. But may we, as God's people, look forward to Sunday as a time of refreshment, revival, and renewal. That's what we need to do. Lord, I need your refreshing, refreshment. I need your renewal. Right? As the psalmist said in Psalm 122, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. I was glad. So I need to spend time with my God. That's what I need. Psalm 37, delight thyself also in the Lord and he shall give thee the desires of your heart. At the time of our text, Israel was in captivity. I'm talking about Isaiah 58. Israel was in captivity they were dwelling in the midst of the pagan Babylonians and their culture. That's what he was doing. Or that's what they were doing. To the Babylonians, a Sabbath meant absolutely nothing. It was just another day. Work and activity. Well, are we not living in a modern Babylon today? They want to take away the Lord's Day? Let's open up the stores and let's do the shopping. Let's make it... What's the difference? In fact, businesses, they hate Sunday closing because they're losing money. They hate it. We're living in modern Babylon. That Babylonian culture is all around us. It meant nothing to them, to the Babylonians. It means very little to so many out there that we're surrounded by. In fact, what's happening today? They're all hyped and excited about it. They're going to the store and they're buying their chicken wings and their beverages. All right? Super Bowl weekend. Oh, this is, this is the highest, greatest weekend that there can ever be. Where does the Lord enter into that? In fact, there are churches that are putting up big screens so that they can show the game during their, in the middle of their service. Churches bringing in that in, bringing that into their into their service. You know this type of practice, this making the Lord's Day just like any other day, certainly happened during the time of Nehemiah. Nehemiah spoke about something like this. Nehemiah thirteen fifteen. In those days, I saw the people in Judah treading wine presses on the Sabbath, bringing in sheaves and loading donkeys with wine, grapes, figs, and all kinds of burdens. And they brought them into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. It just became another day. What's the big deal? One person said this. He said, our great-grandfathers called it the Holy Sabbath. Our grandfathers the Sabbath. Our fathers Sunday. But today, what do we call it? And I'm not just talking about us. I'm just talking in general. It's the weekend. Ah, oh, the weekend has come. Great. I'm tired. I'm so happy for the weekend. It's no longer the Holy Sabbath. Sunday used to be a day whereby God was glorified. Today, right? Just today. Well, even during football. <laughs> football glorified. Oh, may we not seek our own pleasure on this day, but to find pleasure in the God of this day. Find pleasure in Him. To look to Him. To make it a God-honoring day. Not to turn our back on the Sabbath. Not desiring to do our pleasure on His holy day. But to call this day a delight. A holy day of the Lord. Honorable. Lord, help me to do that. Help me to do that from my heart. Help me to seek You. To know You. To be able to spend this day in worship. Because what does this day mean to you? What does this may day truly mean to you? How do you approach this day? This day of worship. This day of rest. Do you prepare for a full participation? Or come half-hearted, ready? Well, hoping that it's done sooner than it's begun. Worship service. 
worship service, right? Hoping it's finished before it's even begun. How do you approach this Sunday worship? In fact, it tells a lot about your spiritual condition. Right? Our minds quickly go to other things. Right? Okay, I'll go to church. We'll do the church thing. And then I've got to do this. I got, you know, we... What are we, how are we really coming before God? Are we really focusing ourselves upon Him? Lord, clear the distractions. I mean, that's, we often pray for that, don't we? Lord, clear the distractions. Take away the responsibilities. All those things that are weighing upon me, impressing upon me. Take them away so that I can focus upon you, that I can truly come and worship you and spend this time, again, refresh, in, in refreshment, in renewal, in reviving my soul. That I might know the spiritual life that I have in Jesus. Lord, make this day a delight for my soul. We need him. We need him. And I close with this congregation. Just a simple illustration, a simple story. There are two woodsmen. One day, one woodsman, so uh, people that work in the woods, challenged the other to an all-day tree chopping contest. How many they can chop by hand with axes? The challenger worked very hard, stopping only for a brief lunch break. The other man had a leisurely lunch, took several breaks during the day. At the end of the day, the challenger was surprised and annoyed to find that the other fellow had chopped substantially more wood than he had. He hadn't stopped. He just worked and worked and worked and worked, thinking that he would do much better. The other fellow rested. Rested. I don't get it. Every time I checked, you were taking a break. You were resting. Yet you chopped more wood than I did. Ah, said the man. This is what the winning woodsman said. He said that I was sharpening my axe when I sat down to rest. Do you notice that? I was sharpening my axe. We're always in need of sharpening things, don't we? Sharpen the soul. How easy we become dull. How easy we feel like I'm spinning my wheels. I'm not getting anywhere. I think, I think I'm, in, I'm trying hard to live for God. I'm trying hard and working for Him. I'm not truly spending time to rest. Sharpen the axe, right? The axe of my soul. The Word of God is what? Quick and powerful. And it is sharper than any two-edged sword. Lord, I need you to pierce me. I need you to touch me. Impact me. Sharpen me. Sharpen me. Sharpen my soul. But we do so by spending time with God. Spending time with Jesus on this day. Rest made the difference for the woodsman. Sabbath rest makes the difference for you and for me. It makes a difference. God gave us this day of Sabbath for our good. He blessed it. He made it holy. May the Lord then enable us to remember this day and that it might be a day of delight, a day of thankfulness, a day of joy. We're coming to meet with God. Remember, this day is good. Not because, again, it's a day off. As I said at the beginning, we can sleep more, spend time with the family, but rather to spend time with our covenant God. He's called us to this place. He said, I want you to come and meet with me. May we do that, praising him, worshiping him, uplifting him, to celebrate the Lord's day. It's a finished work we're celebrating, isn't it? God finished creation, but Jesus finished that new creation. We're made new creatures in Jesus. He created us. He created salvation. Or he accomplished salvation. For our souls. May we rejoice in that. Rejoice in him. May he be a blessing. Let's bow in prayer. Father we thank you. For Sabbath rest. We thank you that we can come. And gather ourselves together. As your covenant people. We can meet with you. It's a time when we're to. Not be filled with our own. Stuff. But rather to be filled. With the stuff of God. To make this day a delight a holy day of the Lord honorable 
to honor you by it, not going in our own ways, not seeking our own pleasure, or even as the Lord has said in Isaiah, to talk idly, but to take the light in the Lord our God. And when we do so, the promise is that he will make us ride on the heights of the earth. Lord, we praise you that you will feed us with the heritage of Jacob, that you'll take care of us and you'll guide and direct our lives. You have said this, Lord. We rest in your word and your promises, the many, many promises in your truth that you've given to us as we spend time with you. And so may we truly celebrate this Lord's Day because we're celebrating Jesus and the finished work he's done for us. And as we come to the table, Lord, bless our time there. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.